Welcome everybody to the Farscape to be continued panel for Comic-Con at Home 2020. We've got a great Hi, group everybody. of guests here. <laughs> We've got Ricky Manning, writer and executive producer. Woo! We've got, you know her, Shiana, the Nibari, Gigi Edgley. Woo! We've got Lonnie Tupu, who of course did Crace and the voice of Pilot. Yeah. We've got Ooh. Rebecca Riggs, come as Amanda Graza. Yeah. Paul Goddard is Stark. Yes. But not least, David Franklin, you know him as Milko Braca. Yo. Comic Con 2020 at home, Farscape panel has begun. Well, thanks everybody for, for joining us. I have a couple uh, things that I want to get out of the way first. If you didn't know, uh, Farscape is on Amazon Prime right now. So it's streaming on Prime. You can binge the entire, every season of it. Um, so if you didn't know that, look that up. You can see all these guys doing all their amazing work. And also, this is a bit of a rumor, but it's kind of exciting. And one of the things I want to talk about is Rock and Brian, Brian Henson, I call him Brian, uh, announced last year that they've been working on ideas for a new series, and Brian would love to shoot it again in Australia with the original cast members. So, okay. that being yeah. said, yeah. let us Hurry begin. up! <laughs> <laughs> so send your, send your checks and dollars. <laughs> well, actually, I am getting younger. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's right. Um, so, uh, first of all, just to, to, the, uh, to everybody, really, when did you guys realize, or when did it kind of hit you personally, that how big Farscape had become and the international phenomenon, in other words, just outside of either Australia or the U.S., uh, when did that hit you back in the day or recently? Thursday. Whenever, yeah. Thursday. Thursday, okay. <laughs> it's about 4.30, I think. Yeah. Just now. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. uh, we were shooting the show uh, in Fox Studios to begin with, I think when at the time, Tom Cruise was shooting Mission Impossible 2. Um, and, that was, and then we transferred from Fox, Fox Studios way up to wherever that was. Um, but we were shooting in, we had no idea what was happening or, or the response from the show because I don't think, had it gone on Channel 9 yet? I think it took forever to get to Channel 9. Yeah. In Australia. Um, but when we were invited to go to um, Los Angeles uh, the following year, and we walked on stage and saw about, you know, a thousand people there. 1800. Um, in Santa Monica. Well, you know, that was, that was the first time we got, ever got anything of how big the show was, and it got bigger. So that's, that's my kind of rec recollection of it. Well, that's the exact same story I was going to say, because I remember we were, you know, Got this invite to go to America and we're like oh this should be fun you know and then off we went and lovely you know service on the airplane picked up in stretch limousines hair and makeup done interviews we're like huh what is happening right now and then we each got uh, introduced on stage at our first uh, comic con i believe it was a creation convention and i want to see that photo because i'm sure we're all like <laughs> well, the other thing, Galaxy Quest had just been released that summer, so everybody, all the Australian actors had seen Galaxy Quest and thought, oh, so this is what a sci-fi convention is like, so they all showed up terrified because <laughs> they had no idea. Um, <laughs> and it was, yeah, but yeah, but 18, I, think, I, I think the first convention had like 1,800 attending, and they came from all over the world. That's what, that's what amazed me. It wasn't just like, well, we drew from Southern California or even from the you know, Western United States. People came from Germany, people came from England. I mean, it was, that's when I really said, this thing is an actual worldwide phenomenon. Uh, and it's got a, a small, crazy, devoted, wonderful fan base. Well, speaking of the fan base and realizing the show's getting bigger, what what stories do you have about getting recognized? I mean, I know a lot of you and a lot of the uh, characters, the actors were, were in makeup. Uh, yeah, exactly, Dave, in half your face. But did you start finding that, you know, especially like, you know, you give your driver's license or you sign a check and they go, hey, you've got the same name. Did any of that stuff happen? The or? first, I remember getting, being in LA and this waitress going, going oh my goodness, you're in Farscape. And I was like, more excited than she was though. <laughs> <laughs> that was a little embarrassing, except once I was coming back from the border from Mex Mexico and, um, and I didn't have my ID, but I had all the, the 
photos from that because I'd been doing a convention in San Diego and, and I had to prove my ID by showing, showing all my <laughs> photos. Did it work? It worked. Worked. I remember going to, I was in Los Angeles on my way to New York and I remember about, about to board the plane and these two police officers saw me and they went, hey, you're that guy from the show, right? And I said, which show? He said, can we have a photo with you? And I'm standing there before I board the plane and these two police officers having shot with me. It's just hysterical. So that was, I went, oh my God, it's really, really wide. You know, a uh, a, a recent one for me was um, my 93-year-old. I just went back to the UK to, to reside in the UK again from the Gold Coast, Australia. And she got herself a, an 87-year-old boyfriend. And um, yeah. after a while, she discovered that he's a huge Star Trek fan. And he'd watch oh, yeah. him all on DVDs. He's 87. Maybe, maybe the relationship is just a ruse to get close to the... <laughs> I didn't want to say that. <laughs> <laughs> That makes sense now. That's, yeah. that's, a, that's a long time stalking. <laughs> <laughs> no wonder he's like 20 years. A long I time stalking. I an extraordinary uh, man um, who uh, works in emergency communication, uh, has worked with Barack Obama, I, and I, I was fangirling his incredible capacity in that role. And I was in this situation where we had a long drive from Sydney up past Brisbane in a car and we were talking about all sorts of things and I was fangirling him about that and it became evident about one and a half hours in that he loved Farscape. So the conversation switched from talking about emergency communication to talking about everything about Farscape and it was just, it was a joy. It's what, he is an extraordinary man and, and it was a, a joy to be able to give him that and a signed autograph and it's on his shelf. Yeah. That's fantastic. If you charge retail price. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, no, I, I'm over and above. We wouldn't respect you otherwise. <laughs> oh, I love you, David. <laughs> now, do you guys go to conventions often? Is this kind of a once a year occurrence or in, in, I don't know if in Australia, I have no idea what's going on there. In the US, yeah, I think yeah. we have. Neither do they. What's that? I've been doing the the Comic Cons for uh, about 20 years now. <laughs> confession time. Okay, confession. Uh, and I am like so, as we all are, you know, we wouldn't be here unless mm -hmm. it was for you guys, the fans out there. So we want to thank you from the bottom yeah. of our hearts and souls. You know, it's been a very amazing journey for all of us and Absolutely. you've been with us every step of the way so thank you for letting us live our dreams and tell these amazing stories you know this uh, this comic con family and community it's really that it's a lot of the people that came to our very first one 20 years ago have come to many along the way so it is like a big family now isn't it and and you the the relationship develops and changes and and yeah, twenty years. Oh my god! So yeah, I was was a little bit Alan Rickman when I first started. He's like, shouldn't be doing conventions. I'm an actor. <laughs> and then I got over myself and um, just had the best time. And and it's 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 that that has a life and and a and a vitality that sp sprang from the show and it's is connected, but is is separate as well. It's a really interesting dynamic. Kind of riffing off saying, you know, you want to be Alan Rickman. You're all trained actors. They don't really train actors for sci-fi or working with green screen and all that. So you, you have your serious credentials and you get these parts in this series. How would you compare or describe acting in something where it's all basically fantastic, it's all made up, and finding, you know, especially you're playing an alien. So the process of developing those characters and making them seem real or identifiable, but also alien. I think that, uh, I'm sure you all have different processes. I, I'm really interested in that. And I'm sure the fans are too, how, how you came up with where you ended up. Besides the writing, the internal process and making up fake characters that aren't fake. based on humans. Fake? Fake? Aren't fake? based on humans, I mean. Oh, <laughs> Well, the actor's like, huh? <laughs> well, no, I mean, but that's the process. You're, uh, nobody knows what a, uh, 
oh god there's so many different names for the character but what these creatures are like and mm -hmm. you have to make it relatable to human but again you also have to think oh i'm not a human so since ben isn't here <laughs> this, this applies to all of you except for ricky but you had to write characters <laughs> yeah first of all okay. that part of that was done by beautiful, beautiful writing. I think that has, that we would all acknowledge that. Fantastic. And that, that inspires certain choices that we made. And um, I think actually the hardest thing for me to, to get my head around was that she was a, a psychopath rather than an alien. You know, right. that that's a big step. Um, an alien is part of that. How, she, how that culture impacted her um, lack of, uh, empathy, morals, um, you know, commitment to anything other than our own agenda um, was kind of really interesting to explore. And, and part of that was um, from the seeds of the very first um, screen tests, which I thought gave me lots of clues. And you jump on the wave and you write it best you can. That's a very abbreviated answer from me. So <laughs> hear what some of the others say. And you, 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 you don't say, oh, my character wouldn't do that. It's like, oh, okay. <laughs> My character's going this way today. Yep. Yeah. And so you, 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 you commit. Like, it's amazing what you can get, get through, get by with when you commit. And, and for that, that moment, that, that's your truth. And it, when you put those disparate parts together, we, you know, at, at the audience join the dots and go, whoa. That's, and I assume the, the makeup and the costuming help too. Oh you look my in the mirror, like, I had, oh, I I had like a good six minutes in makeup. <laughs> like every are, you, are you okay, David? I, was that hard for you? Must have been. It's not. Oh. It was a sacrifice that I made for the show. <laughs> you are such a professional. <laughs> it's, also, it's also called, it's also called cutting, cutting our losses. It's like, you know, what, what's the point? Oh, yeah. More makeup's not, make make not going to help. So, you know. <laughs> <laughs> hey, cool. Hey, cool. No, yeah. I so mean, what was it like for sitting for those hours, people that were in prosthetics? And I was in there for three well, minutes because I only had half a face to be done, and it was just <laughs> around the dirt and make sure that my my stubble, my hair, was short enough, and that was it. Then I'd slap on the mask. Sometimes they'd start to make up the whole face, and I go, "Don't worry about me. Don't bother. Don't bother. <laughs> yeah. It's just light." Yeah. The, uh, what about, the, what about you, Gigi? Gigi? How long did it take? Uh, three and a half hours. Uh, it just didn't, I just didn't rock up at work looking like that. <laughs> I wish. If they, uh, I wonder if there were, if we just like went home, if I just went one day, don't worry, just leave it on for yeah. tomorrow. Just how, yeah. how long it could have lasted. Uh, but it was three and a half hours makeup and an absolute delight. I loved it because Process. Yes, because you got so much for free. You're like, oh my gosh, she's she, she's a creature. She's an, and right. I've always been so obsessed with the dark crystal and the labyrinth and anything Henson. So to be part of that world and that universe was like, this is happening, and all the uh, the creatures on set as well, Rigel and Pilot and the Scarens and the never ending list of amazing creations from the creature shop. You you don't. Mm have to act you just have to yeah. surrender to the yeah. situation because oh the writing the costume the makeup it's just and I, was, I remember the first time i saw um saw a pilot it was huge oh, yeah, yeah. i i i because i i wasn't in that part of the world and i was just walking right. around one day and went oh my god <laughs> because yeah. of the creature shop and the massive sets in the space we had yeah. there was very relatively very little green screen but yes you just yeah. had it literally there to work with which was fantastic I, I, that, your your suspension of disbelief playing the characters really translates out to the show where it's very yeah. believable lonnie you were going to say something the puppets were believable though weren't they uh, oh yeah, I mean, we, when I was working with uh, Rigel, for example, um, Rigel wasn't a puppet. Rigel, to me, was a was a was a person I had to interact with, and um, and that was the best part of, about it. Uh, it was play. You know, every time we went there, going to work was playtime. and um, you just become like a kid where you you just believe. Right. That Rigel is 
a person and you have an argument with him and it's fantastic <laughs> off screen yeah. like Right. <laughs> and with Jonathan, it would be a long argument. <laughs> ben always yeah. used to say that that yeah, they would. The weird thing though, you'd be acting with Rigel, and then the director would call cut, and Rigel would go into a coma. And that was <laughs> just, so just, oh yeah, wait a minute, they've stopped working Rigel. Like, yeah. So that was you know, it was it was the part where he wasn't acting that was the odd part for a lot of oh, actors. Funny. <laughs> what? Another thing I was curious because I was in L.A. when all this was happening. When you first saw the first few episodes, uh, particularly you guys in the first season, when did, or when did it hit you that this was something, because you never know. I mean, I remember stories about the people who worked on Star Wars, Harrison Ford in particular was like, I don't know, man, it was a paycheck. He didn't, you know, he just thought it was silly. And I'm not saying any of you thought uh, it was silly, but what did, when did it hit you like, oh God, this is a thing. This is a universe, particularly, you know, in actors, you do scenes, it's very it's not linear, you know, you're doing scenes that are end the show in the beginning of the show. When did it kind of hit you that, oh, this is a bigger universe and a more, I don't know, that it came together to be Farscape. Did that, was there a moment that you remember that that happened? Um, very, very quickly for me, it was, I remember thinking that it has, it's uh, really Shakespearean. Mm -hmm. The storyline that we were working with the intensity that we were working with it really what you had to be in that mindset and um i don't know if if, if it worked like that for other actors but for me it was it had to be it had to take on the mantle of you know a shakespearean tragedy or comedy or whatever it was it wasn't um it wasn't an intimate show it had that, to be a big show that, uh, that, was big exactly what? that we were working on I was thinking of Lani is is when I'm. Um, I think it might have been my first day, or, or early days. I think maybe before I'd shot anything, I'd gone there to get the makeup test, what have you. And I went and I watched a scene, and Ben was in the chair being tortured by Scorpius, and there was uh, froth coming out of his mouth and out of his <laughs> eyes, and he was just absolutely going for it in a way that in Australian TV, TV you don't get the chance to do. And, and I thought, wow, this is. <laughs> A level that this can be played at uh, and I think that that helped me when I then went the next day shot my side your side and realized how big it could be as long as as David said you you endure it with the truth your own truth mm. you could go shoot for the stars it's mm. fantastic for every department across the board mm. you're just doing hospital dramas or police dramas as right. we've all done it's so banal and prosaic compared to what you get in that universe spoiled. that's what i was getting at as actors you get to you get a much bigger range than you know tell me doctor will he live you know it's like <laughs> the planet uh ricky as as a writer or producer when you're you're setting the tone of a show because you know how kind of the the range uh the dramatic range and even the the far out range of what concepts was there and i know star trek you know set set a tone many years earlier with we're going to go for political issues and all that was there any kind of internal guidance between rock and you guys uh about what this show is going to deal with uh conceptually politically and that and those, and those kind of things besides the characters and their stories I, I wouldn't say necessarily politically but conceptually rock and david from the very beginning were really really clear on this is a show that we're going to go for it we are not going to do Star Trek. We all grew up on Star Trek. We love Star yeah. Trek. It's not, it's not any, in any way a knock, but it's like, that's been done. We're going to do this instead. Right. And they were, from the very beginning, on my very first freelance script for them, they were saying, push it, push it, surprise us. Go places right. you didn't think you could go on television, uh, which for a writer is like, you know, it's like being handed the keys to a, a, uh -oh. a Mercedes. It's like, yeah. yes, <laughs> okay, now let's, let's, <laughs> let's go for it. And we had writers come in and pitch, good writers who just couldn't get that, they would pitch a Star Trek, basically. Right. They would say, oh, Captain Crichton does this. We'd say, no, 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 Crichton's not the captain. Crichton's the least knowledgeable <laughs> guy on the boat. If right. he gives an order, they're all going to laugh at him. Right. That's not the show. These are, these are a bunch of people who have been thrown together, and they don't like each other. They really don't like each other, right. and they're going to be at each other's throats for quite a while. And, you know, it's, it was going to be totally anarchy, and we're not going to do things that way. And that, that you know, it's those of us... 
that caught on to that, I think we, you know, we, we stayed with the show a while, like Justin Manjo came in and, and totally got that. And, and he was with us forever, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah crazy, the, the, the marvelous Manch. So, uh, you know, and, and when the crew and the cast could do that, which they did beautifully, wonderfully, that's, I think, what set this show apart, that it would just go there. It would just go to places that, you know, and, and you know, we weren't, oh, who's, who's Sorry, that was, my, that was my computer. Spielberg. That's it's feeding slab. time. That's, yeah, that, that's, a, that's, that's beers for everybody on set when that happens. Uh, so yeah, we were encouraged to push it, push the limits on. I think everybody everybody on cast and crew got into that vibe and just, just did amazing things that couldn't have been done, I don't think anywhere else either. I think Australia was a big part no, of it. No, I think that Australia really, mm-hmm. really flavored. It. Mm-hmm. And, and I think like from the, from the, pilot episode of the first episode you could see that the 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 evolution of of the australian being in, in, imbued in by imbued yeah the tone of it but that's yeah, what i mean it had such a it's a hard <laughs> <laughs> thank god you have writers <laughs> um, for ricky being that far removed geographically from the United States, did it give you a certain freedom and license that you wouldn't have had necessarily if you were shooting in in in, in LA or Toronto even? Yes, definitely, because uh, again, the Australian televisionists had never done a show remotely like this. Right. So they didn't know that it was impossible. <laughs> <laughs> With the yeah. creatures and the makeup and the sets and the everything, this was an impossible show to make. And I came down there saying like, this is, this is not going to happen. <laughs> this is, they are biting off this gigantic thing that they're going to try and do. And the Hanson company hadn't had that much experience in dramatic television either. So it was kind of new to everybody. Yeah. Uh, and again, and the Australians just, you know, just jumped right in. And I like to say, we, you know, on every script, you have a production meeting and you have all the department heads there and they're complaining about there's usually too much in the script that we don't have the time to do this. We don't have the money to do this. And you're, you know, you're, you're trying to knock the script down to what is possible to do. And the Australian production meetings on Farscape were always departments are jumping up and saying, can we do more here? Yeah. Can we blow something up? Can we do this? Can we do that? And we, we you know, great. You know, these, these people, you know, they, they, <clears throat> I, I remember Brian talking because after the first season, maybe even in the middle of whenever I saw him after a couple seasons and I said, what's it like, you know, shooting in Australia? And he said, he, you know, he says, what's great about it is exactly that. They will throw themselves. They want to plus everything. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but he also said when it's 445 or whatever, like 15 minutes before quitting time, he's like, all ah, right, yeah, we're done. He said they didn't have to do overtime, which in the no. U.S. is like, it's all overtime. Like you kill your styles. He's like, and, and he wasn't complaining. He was just saying it was so different. In other words, they will throw themselves at the grenade until it's about time to go home because they don't, they repre- appreciate their home lives, their, their life and that, outside of the show. Well, and, that, and that to me was a real benefit of being there because right. I got into that, you know, because again, we're all, you know, all of us American type A types were down there. We need this on the set at eight o'clock in the morning. And right. the Australians go, yeah, right. Now, sure, mate, she'll be right. Which we quickly learned. Sorry, <laughs> it's not, not worries. No worries. Happen. No worries. No worries. Oh, no worries. Galaz. It's not going to happen. But what the hell, you know? And they, yeah, they, they work a twelve-hour day, and then they vote. If we want them to do overtime, they vote. <laughs> that was it. And they usually <laughs> vote it down. But if one, it down. If one <laughs> person <laughs> says no, yeah, it's double golden slasher time, guys. Money, yeah. money, money. Ah, I'd rather go to the pub, mate. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> so Brian, Brian. Brian. I remember yeah, Brian was, saying you had a great appreciation for that. In other words, kill yourself until twelve hours up. Yeah, I know, and we got it done. We still got it done, you know. Yeah. And we got to, and we got to go to the pub, and they have great pubs. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah, it really, it, I learned a lot about that. Like, yeah, just chill out a little bit. We'll get it done. We'll get it have, done. Yeah. Have any of you done sci-fi? Have any of you worked on a sci-fi series since Farscape or even fantasy? A lot. Right. <laughs> it's true. funny because when you go to this so straight after oh sorry straight after whoa, whoa, whoa. straight after farscape uh i worked on australian television which was very doctors and nurses and cops and robbers and right. all that fun stuff far and away uh, right and um and then as soon as i moved to the right. states because i'd done one sci-fi that's all that you go for now they're like okay so you so you're you play an alien on a sci-fi and i go oh i also do um other stuff so they go so you do comedy as well i'm like yes yes i can do comedy and drama i'm like yes yes and host and sing and dance I'm like but so but you are a sci-fi it's it's very funny over here it's very different like in australia i i feel like 
it's um, a lot more open-minded in a way. Yeah. I don't know. Is that the right way to? I to think say it's the it? British, the British tradition of actors act. It, it's not like yes. oh, you're a sci-fi actor, you're a comedy actor. You yes. you do acting, and I think America, it's very marketing-driven, and you know, branding. What's your brand, Gigi? Oh, you're sci-fi. You know, uh, and I don't, I don't know Australia, I guess because it's a smaller market. And again, I think it pulls from that British tradition of like, you're an actor, you can act. I mean, and, and, and even casting against type. Is no. there a, a, a difference between LA actors and New York actors? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just posing the question. Is there a different mindset between? I think theater, yes, but uh, you know, film and television tends to be out here. I mean, that I've seen, New York has a huge theater, uh, you know, uh, aesthetic and, and, and that's a different mindset, uh, a bit more serious in a way, or, uh, and also mm. a lot more difficult. You have to memorize, you know, entire shows where TV and film acting is, you get a couple pages in and then, you know, there's a cut. Um, that's the only thing I've noticed, but I don't socialize with actors. I, I hang out with the birds. I don't do that. You hate it when, you? <laughs> don't you hate it when, oh, when you're oh, the point. Shooting, shooting something and, and it's separate, it's written as, as separate scenes and then oh, you, get, yeah. you get to shoot it and they go, okay, um, we're going to put that all together. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's that's the that's the that's the hard part of film and television acting. Ricky, do writers get uh, pigeonholed too? Have you been like, oh, you're a sci-fi writer, or oh you, yeah, oh yeah, absolutely, definitely, uh, yeah. There's the, there is that. So uh, the, these days, with the genres mixing and with the industry fragmenting and with the Netflix, and we're going through such monumental changes as mm -hmm. a, as an industry those lines are starting to blur a little bit because the genres are starting to mix a lot more and it's becoming a lot more yeah. acceptable. More mashups, you know. Yeah. yeah, I mean, when we were when we were on, it, you know, it was the turn of the century when Farscape was on, and I remember sci-fi was initially very, I mean, they, they were very happy about it, but they were very surprised that our demographic was pretty evenly split male-female. Right. At that time, for a science fiction show, that was, that was uh, fairly unheard of. Uh, wow. and we were very, we were very proud of that. We said, "Great, you know, we're we're we're, you know, we're not we're not just appealing to a hardcore, traditionally male audience. We've got we've got a, a wider appeal than that." But it's yeah, you, you do get to mainstream now, like with Westworld, the success of Westworld. Um, right. You know, there's a number of shows that have gone mainstream, so I think that's facilitating a crossover. When you've got something like Anthony mm -hmm. Hopkins in a sci-fi, that's yeah. broken boundaries. Um, yeah, and there's a number of there's another one. Um, can't remember it, but there seems to be a number of ones that are high profile that have actors oh. from West, uh, not West Wing, but the uh, the other political one with Kevin Spacey and uh, oh, well, yeah, 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 House yeah, of that Cards. House, House of Cards. Cards. Yeah, there's uh, yeah. he's the lead from House of Cards. He's the lead yeah. in this other sci-fi one. So I think, as you're saying, Ricky, that that's it's all fragmenting because of cable. And well, and the mashup. I think sci-fi used to be it was either Star Trek or Star Wars. And Doctor mm. Who was sort of the campy British version, and that yeah. was it. And yeah. so those are the three bins you could, you know, and that's what people expected. And I think, because like you're saying, with Westworld and and more uh, heady, more intellectual, I won't hate, well, uh, intellectual is maybe not the right word, but, uh, you know, more Asimov, less uh, Edgar Rice Burroughs. Yeah. Um, you, you get uh, a, a bigger range. And I think also, you, like Star Trek did, you can play with themes and social issues and not offend anybody. Yeah, um, and because I, I think we're living there now yeah. we're living in the that's kind of sci-fi world now Black we're mirror, yeah. Yeah. definitely the questions about ai and the challenges the ethical challenges the moral challenges we're there so we're living in um, black mirror mm. interesting yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah my Farscape, writing is very i, I, I found Farscape that. very sorry when no, i jumped on stop <laughs> you're so naughty i found Farscape very uh when i first uh, jumped on the set because I, I I was more into phantasmagorical and that kind of energy. So I I never really, to be honest with you, connected very deeply with sci-fi until the land of Farscape. And Farscape to me, when I was on set, even though there was aliens and spaceships and creatures and critters, didn't feel like a sci-fi. It felt like a crazy, wild, organic, raw, misfit family 
tumbling through the uncharted territories, if that makes any, it, it, it felt That's, deeper and more organic and more raw than the sci-fis that I'd seen before. It was so much about the relationships and the complexity yeah. of the relationships, right. be, it, be it with Crichton and, and Scorpius, you know, that incredible relationship. There, all, all the relationships were fraught and tense and problematic. And that's, that was the original always, Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, I guess that's what I always thought science fiction was or could be or should be. Um, as I was growing up, I loved reading science fiction and, and I always thought that science fiction was centrally about what it was to be human <laughs> by sort of pulling that apart into non-humans. Um, you know, so that... Reading Asimov, obviously reading Ursula Le Guin. Um, if you're if you're diving into um, a culture that only has one gender, then what does that do to what it is to be human? And that teaches you a lot. So I always felt that science fiction was essentially and massively about humans, and so that Fast Cape was a beautiful part of that for me. As as actors and having done these more unique characters than you probably said before or after. Was there something in the process that stretched you as an actor and you appreciate, in other words, if you hadn't done something as wild or weird, did it help you in your, your tool, your bag, your bag of tricks or your, your tool uh, set as actors for doing, like you said, more Shakespearean, bigger stuff as opposed to, you know, cops and nurses shows. It was definitely very exciting. It, it was a show where if you didn't go 150% and up, it would swallow you up, I think. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was about 22-ish at the time. And I rem I was just a wee baby. A wee baby. A little baby. And I remember um, all the, like literally all the people that were my idols that I grew up watching on Australian television coming onto the set of Farscape as guesties, you know, and we're, we're like teaching them how to fly the spaceship or teaching them how to communicate with Rigel or teaching them, And it was like, try not to fangirl out about it because the word had got around town how amazing Farscape was. You know, it was huge. Australia had never seen anything like that before. It brought in financial abundance. It brought um, amazing stories. It brought, everyone was wanting to get on the set of Farscape. So uh, it definitely it definitely stretched any actor that placed one foot on that set, didn't it, guys? You had to really go I, for it. I remember seeing some beautiful um, Australian TV actors come on and who whose work I admired on television, very naturalistic, but they couldn't, as you said, lift it up to fill out that suit. Um, and so often it was more the, the actors who had theatre experience who came on mm -hmm. and knew that they could go huge and, you know, reach the back, back of the theatre with their performance right. in order to get outside that massive suit that they were trapped in in, in some ways. Initially, it was very, very difficult because the only reference that actors had that were coming onto the set was Star Trek. Right, right. So that was their, their only reference point. And then they just really had to watch very, very carefully how we were working and playing it and realized that they needed to just come up, you know, be more intense about what it was that they were doing. It wasn't a, it wasn't a kind of a, a very, um, they just couldn't get it, some of them. But when they did get it, it was fantastic. They went, oh my God, we can actually do this. But, but actors, I, I remember watching them really come into grips with the fact of the way that we were playing it was not a domestic drama. We were going for it. And they went, oh, okay, I think we need to, I need to go for it as well. So, um, and then after a while, when they started seeing the show on television, then they suddenly go, oh, okay, right. That's where we need to be in our performance. That, that level, that tone. Yeah. So mm -hmm. we've got a little, we've got about 10 minutes left. And I know the room, I mentioned the rumor at the top that they're, well, and it's not a rumor, uh, Brian and Rock are talking about a new, a new, uh, new series or uh, continuing. Um, and I want, it's a fun question and there's no wrong answers, but I wanted to ask you guys, what is your character doing in the first episode of the new series? This is, this is conjecture. There is no script written at the moment, but I'm curious as, <laughs> and then Ricky, you can tell us what you would like to be writing, but we'll, we'll start with the, the cast. What would your character be doing or what would you like your character to be doing? Uh, we'll start with the ladies. So we'll start with Rebecca. Oh, good on me. All right, here it is. 
Um, I reckon that Grazer is sitting talking to her daughter, which who I have called Estella for my own very specific Miss Havisham reasons. <laughs> um, and she, the daughter is grown. Uh, I think Grazer is facing some challenges based on her genetic. Um, tinkering early in her life and she wields power through this beautiful girl and, and she surprisingly enough loves her but in the same way that people often love exquisite cars or phenomenal horses that win a lot of races and so that she is talking about what Estella has been achieving and giving her interesting advice there you go nice Thanks, the answer to oh, how I that you can't top that. That was amazing. <laughs> um, breathing. <laughs> it's still yours, Ricky. Uh, <laughs> what's she doing? Oh, what would you want her doing? to be doing? There's no wrong answer. She's definitely got to. I don't know. It's got to start with something like this. Her like warrior cry and everybody block your eardrums but she she was a bit of a fan of the old like something like that just to kick it off and then <laughs> oh, that's how we'd like to start a series <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then she makes a latte and reads the paper uh -huh. <laughs> the nails a little bit like this <laughs> man this right. is an arby's paul uh, so I've got two two versions. One is he's you're in some kind of dungeon area and he's he's leading these little children who have half masks, other bannock slaves. <laughs> he's been going around seeking out bannock slaves. These little kids are being used to do what he was used for, which was to take the pain of wealthy people and and generals and what have you. So they've they've been used like that. So he's escaping with those kids. The other version is you cut to a nice kind of lounge room, warm lighting, um, some nice antique furniture, and then you see that he's he's set up shop as a psychotherapist. Um, <laughs> yes. No, he's either he's either he's either and Oscar Schindler or Sigmund Freud. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And, and when he gets he gets pissed off because this person is taking too much time to actually get their shit together and it's not working, so he just reveals the mask. And then the light and just goes, look, let's go. <laughs> this will save you a lot of money and me a lot of boredom. <laughs> That's his thing. Oh, I'm sorry, our time's up. <laughs> <laughs> we'll pick it up again next week. Dave, since you're chatty, you tell us what's your character doing? Um, <laughs> I think the Scorpius, you know how he has that, what's it called? That cooling rod. Yeah, the cooling <laughs> rod. Yes. Well, I call it the. <laughs> um, I think every night he goes into Scorpius's quarters, <laughs> schooling rod, and tampers with it because, and and then tweaks it so that 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 Scorpius is in an exquisite pain, and almost dies but doesn't wow. because he's oh. yeah. dark. Dark. Is it really? Oh. <laughs> Sure, revenge. Ralph. Revenge. All right, Lonnie. I think he comes to see you in a, a in a therapy session, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> I think he's in a funk. This, this is pilot. Nothing, <laughs> fits <laughs> nothing fits anymore. Right. <laughs> yeah. I, know that. I know that story. Yeah, he goes through all these refits. <laughs> <laughs> now, what about what about pilot? Oh, pilot, God. <laughs> Having his nails done. <laughs> yeah. That would take a long time. I think there are little pilots. Yeah. Ah, little pilots. Yes. Nice. Pilots. Yeah. Is, ah. he, is, he, is, he, is he training them? Is he raising them? Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Brian just went, well, there goes the budget. <laughs> Ricky, are you getting all this? You're taking all this? <laughs> oh, well, and that, that, that's, where, that's where we're going. Is, is, is Ricky, what would you like? Both. You don't have to do the first episode. What would you like to do? with the series of the characters or again it's open-ended and no one will hold you to this except diehard fans who heard this <laughs> uh oh well the weird thing is the fun of farscape was not kind of having that much of a plan uh that's why <laughs> the notion of doing this as a series again instead of a two hour uh 
and, and being able to go 10 episodes or 13 episodes and rock and, and, and Brian, I think are, are, are kind of, uh, of similar, similar uh, inclination that part of the fun of the original was, it was like more like improv jazz than plotting out a, a symphony. Uh, we would sort of start them in a place and we'd sort of have some idea where they were going to go and we would just start going and we would just, we would take side trips. We would improvise a lot of the stuff on the show that happened that turned into major plot elements didn't come about because we sat down and thought it through is because somebody in the creature shop did something weird or Andrew Prowse had a rod coming out of Scorpius's head and dailies that we didn't expect to see. Uh, or one of the actors would do something really interesting and we'd say, let's, we're going to roll with that. We're going to use that. And that, that to me, I think was part of what gave the series its, its energy because everybody was willing to improvise. Everybody was willing to, to, again, we needed actors that could commit and that could, you know, roll with it. But, but boy, did we have that. So we, you know, again, we could, we, we could throw just about anything at them and they, just like, they'd all hit it out of the park. I, so I would just love to have that chance again to just, just, you know, throw out some melodies and let, let the band take it up and, and see where it goes. I think that's what created that organic tone and also that feedback loop with the artists driving stories and the stories driving the artists. And, and you get that bigger world mm -hmm. that it isn't just somebody handing down, make this on the paper. And again, the actors contributing. I think that's what made uh, Farscape such a, a fun, rich show as opposed to just like, OK, we, we kind of know where it's going because, you know, they're following some uh, some mm -hmm. person's idea of what the show is about. Um, we've and got I a couple was, minutes left. I just wanted to, oh, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, when I was going to be massively pregnant for the miniseries, um, you know, David Kemper rang me up and said, we, we've heard something about you. And I went, ew, what? And it was that I was pregnant. I went, indeed. And he said, it's science fiction. We can do anything. And so there I was, you know, essentially nine months pregnant. <laughs> Aliens. You know, shooting Grazer. It was great. <laughs> yeah. Um, they, I just wanted to ask everybody where, where people can find you now before we wrap up. Um, okay, so we started the ladies last time. We'll start with the gentleman. We'll start with uh, Lonnie first because you were last. Oh, what, what was Sorry, what was it? Chris? Oh, where would we find you? On social media or what are you up to? Are you working on anything? Or oh, anything? Um, yes, I'm doing some painting, um, oil painting again. In fact, this is a show and tell. Oh, right good. Now. So this is what I've... I'm still oh, working wow. on this. I don't know if you can see it. Oh, lovely. Yeah. Beautiful. Looks just yeah. like you. So, <laughs> Perfect likeness. And my funniest little one is the little baby one. Ah, well, that's oh. great. That's so great. anyway, um, you know, I've got an Instagram account, voiceover Lani Tupu. Uh, talks. Talks. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> and you're doing a lot of, uh, you're doing a lot of voiceover work. You know what? I went for my first voiceover job last week and I thought that I had, hadn't been working for two months. My wife told me it had been five months oh, wow. since I had last work. And I went, oh, right. <laughs> so, but I've now built myself a little home studio with a camping table. Oh, great. Three sides and foam. So I'm tweaking, I'm tweaking. Oh, look, is it? What's that, David? Dave, Dave, it's Rigel. Oh, yes. You, David. Dave, Dave, where we find you? What are you up to besides playing with your lovely dog? Go to Sydney Park, taking Moses for a run, go for a walk. I have to take him for a walk now because I said the W word. Just chugging along. Chugging, chugging. And where we find you on social media anywhere? Oh, Insta I think I'm Frankly Dave on Instagram. I'm a bit, I'm a bit remiss in posting regularly, but yeah, Frankly Dave. Cool. Paul? Uh, I'm not on social media. I'm just um, buried here at home working on my kids' audio project, which is getting close to completion. I've been talking about it for uh, over 12 years each time I've gone to a convention and it's getting close to finishing. And when it is, then I'll have a social media presence and I'll go back on Gigi's show hopefully wow. to to let people know. Fantastic. Ricky? Uh, I've been doing some teaching. I'm teaching at UCLA Extension in the writers program. Nice. Uh, courses in TV writing, uh, dramatic TV writing and pilot writing which has been a lot of fun because I try oh. and run the classroom like a miniature writer's room 
and show people what fun it is to collaborate and in this wonderful, crazy business that we're in. And you can find me at my website, frunium.com, F-R-O-O-N-I-U-M.com. And that's also got a link to my Twitter, which is at frunium. Uh, and I waste a lot of time on the Twitter, so you can usually find and annoy me there. Great, Jeej. Uh, so I'm everywhere because why not? Uh, Facebook, Instagram, Patreon, Twitch, Twitter, Man. your mom's house. No, just nice. kidding. Um, so, uh, and I've just, yeah, I've, <laughs> I've just um, jumped onto Twitch uh, because I, we were on our way to a comic con and we got sent back obviously because the world shut down. Wow. So uh, I'm like, how do I connect with everybody and, and uh, share the love? So it's Gigi Edgley, Twitch TV. I have amazing guests like all of you guys here have popped on to say hello. I'm chasing Rebecca as we speak. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's from Tuesday to Saturday, five o'clock every day. We watch Farscape. We, I do some fun singing stuff. We have some great guests. It's lots and lots of fun. And yeah, come on, come on by. Lovely. And last but not least, lovely Rebecca. Um, well, I'm on the Book of Face because I'm old and I will join um, Zhij on Twitch because I think that Yay. sounds exciting. Um, I've been really, really busy because I've been working in COVID communications um, over the last month. So not as an actor, but as a comms professional and I'm tired now. Um, but I'm writing a play which is set in a dinner party and it's probably about consent, power, and democracy. And it's a comedy. And um, I'll let you know when it's done. Oh, great. Well, I think we've run out of time. But Wait, where can, we find, where can we find you, Kirk? What are you uh, doing? I'm here in my office. Okay, <laughs> Kirk, the, the address? Um, uh, Kirk, we'll, be there, <laughs> we'll be there in 20 minutes. <laughs> I'm, I'm brewing up some tea. Um, www.kirkrthatcher.com is my website. And then Instagram. Uh, Facebook and Twitter. Oh, cool. also, if people would like to share the love of Farscape, anytime you put it on social media, if you can tag at Farscape is the official page, and also um, Farscape now is the fan page as well. So if you hashtag it and add the at, then that would be fantastic. And watch, 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 watch it on Amazon Prime. Yeah. Spread the word. Spread the word. Spread, spread the, the word. word. We love. We have to go. I think our time oh. up here is done. Thank you all from all over the world. This has been great. Farscape continues. Thank you, Good to see you guys. Bye bye. Good to see you. Cheers. To the old, wasn't it? The dating game. Bye.